good Slim Jim. But when you're when you're working and you're filming and people are, are expecting you to be there for ten hours and to get this stuff done, you don't want to have Slim Jims in your in your belly. So I learned a valuable lesson that time. Guys, I think we just lost a sponsor. Uh... Yeah. Hey, everybody, and welcome once again to another edition of the Talking About Cars podcast with me. I'm Randy Cardoon, and him, yeah, it's Hot Rod Bob Beck. Hello, Mr. Beck. Hey, Muller, how you doing? Uh, once again, we've come up with incredible backgrounds for our show yes. pictures today. I am coming up with, uh, right here, the most chrome-laden vehicle in American automotive history, the 1958 Buick, and there's a lot of chrome back there, including the taillights, and you can see that grill, and it's it's a chrome magnet. I mean, there's just all sorts of stuff on there. Buick kind of went over to the top just a little bit in 1958. Well, they got more chrome on that. It, to re-chrome all that, it would cost more than all my cars, and I have seven. Yeah. <laughs> and to top it off, I think uh, uh, that was the year 1958. There was a slump in the market. So most cars, that was the year Edsel came out. Remember that? Yeah. And, uh, it kind of tanked, and a lot of it was because of the economy. So, yeah, it's uh, one of those things that uh, yeah. a lot of people looked at and kind of thought, eh, well, timing is yeah. everything. Kind of tanked is an overstatement. And behind you, of course, uh, I see your wife is there in the bikini. Oh, sure, yeah. Mm -hmm. Wait, wait, wait a minute. Hold on. Okay. Oh, okay, well, maybe. Yeah, okay. yeah maybe not. I, I don't know. I didn't say that. I well, you know, if, we, if, if I go down further, you can see me doing some interviews there. I mean, let's see. There. Oh, there you go. Look at that. There I am. See, I, I'm down on trackside doing interviews, my that, normal position. Is that your uh, brown jacket there? I couldn't tell. Yeah, could be. All right. So, <laughs> of course, here talking about cars, our motto, everybody has a car story. And before we get going, uh, this past weekend, uh, in real time, uh, we'll our our uh, streaming network, Power Two TV, had this big reveal, big reveal where they brought out the I know, right? They uh, brought, yeah, they brought out the big reveal, the new uh, address on the on the internet. Uh, you can pick it up. Watch PT. Wait, what? Uh, watch PT TV. Power Tube TV. Uh, again, that's uh, .com, and you can see that, and and you can check out all the shows that are on the uh, new uh, network. You can check out where you can pick it up. Chances are, I'm imagining, if you're watching us right now, you figure it out one of the ways. Uh, the, we're on Roku now. We're on all sorts of places and more stuff to come. And I understand they're giving away a guitar. Did you see that? Really? No, really? Giving away a guitar made of motor parts. Mm -hmm. that's got to be really heavy <laughs> dude that's heavy oh wow man i dude. that's what i thought the first thing i thought when i heard that is i went gosh you gotta be you, know, you gotta be the rock to be able to like play guitar on that thing or do a riff but maybe well, you know, possibility yeah, so you can ex exercise in the house while you're playing uh you know silent night or something i don't know exactly yeah. uh elsewhere uh did you see on uh Ian Roussel's uh, show, Full Custom Garage. Did yeah. you see he showed up at an episode? The, of Custom the Fuzzy Letterman. A Fuzzy Letterman. And I'm not talking about one of the singers. No. <laughs> no, no. David Letterman in yeah. the garage. Now, keep in mind, this guy lives in New York or New Jersey or wherever. And, and Ian's show is in, well, basically Mojave. Well, the desert. It's in the middle of nowhere. And Dave shows up in the middle yeah. of all this and welds. Welds. They give him a welding thing and he welded. That's that's scary. Yeah. Putting something like that in his hands. Yeah. I mean, what's next? You know, Jimmy Fallon with a, I don't know. <laughs> Spreading Bondo. Spreading Bondo, yes. I think a lot of people think he spreads Bondo all the time. But I might be wrong on that. Yeah. I mean, it, so, on the show today, or wherever you're listening and whenever you're listening, uh, we've got some good stuff. As part of our network, of course, we're showing all these popular older shows like P 
pinks, pinks all out. Um, and the new shows, of course, don't forget them, our friends like uh, Randy Carlson over at Carcheology. He's uh, mm -hmm. on this network now. Uh, Burnout, Nitro Jam TV, All Out Racing, Gearheads, Racing with Mason. And of course, the one we enjoy, Pastime. You remember Pastime. I sure do. And, uh, you know, we, we talk about that on a regular basis because that was a great game show for the card guy. Red Wagner standing by or sitting by. I'm not totally sure. I haven't seen the video. But uh, he's coming up here. <laughs> We're going to talk about uh, pastime. Anything you want to update us before we get to uh, Brett? I, you know, I don't know. We both had busy weekends. You were at car shows and cruises, and I was down in Bowling Green, Kentucky, for the uh, NHRA Wally Parks Nitro Nationals. Yeah, you were there big time with some big time guys. Oh, you know, we had over 400 race cars, probably a thousand plus, maybe even more cars on the beautiful grass at Bowling Green at Beach Bend Raceway Park. Um, it was an amazing weekend of great racing, top fuel. Funny cars, gassers, straight axle mafia, NDLRA, and all sorts of uh, groups racing there. That was it was just fantastic. I didn't get out of the tower long enough to see much of anything uh, <laughs> until Don Gar until I did the cackle fest in the evening, and that's where our Grand Marshal Don Garlitz brought out one of his old swamp rats retrofitted with a new Hemi, and uh, he had that thing cackling. As if it was a vintage 392. It was it was a great weekend. We we enjoyed ourselves, had a lot of fun. I, I have the picture now up close so we can see what the uh, bikini gal behind you looks like. And oh, there you go. Yeah. So you know, I'm anyway, there she is. All right. Coming up next, we're getting ready to be joined by the one, the only Brett Wagner. He's gonna be with us as soon as I Snap my fingers just because I can. Ready, Bob? Let's do it together. I know you can. Okay. No. No, you can't. Yeah. This sounds like a congenital. I'll make it look like it, but I can't. Exactly. One, two, three. And there he is, ladies and gentlemen, the one and the only Brett Wagner. Who, of course, we know him from so many things, but for our purposes here, the lovely and talented Brett Wagner for pastime. The show that uh, actually required some knowledge of automobiles and automobile racing. Welcome to the show. Well, it might have uh, it might have uh, required that, but I didn't have much of that. I, I'm a <laughs> I was very lucky uh, when we did that show that uh, all I had to do was guide the you know guide the show and hand out the money and you know ask a couple questions. So I was very lucky. Yeah, but you got you got them talking, and uh, you you had absorbed some of the knowledge. You know, sure. those guys. I mean, I listen. I didn't know. I knew enough about drag racing when we started to do that show that um, I knew a enough. And then what's very funny is that after the show was done, uh, a couple of years, then I actually went and got my NHRA license and learned to you know r race top dragster and race up in Canada here and there. So. I did. I did the reverse when I should have been drag racing before, and then do the TV show. I I did the reverse. Tell me about hey. how this all started for you, as far as uh, not the love of cars and stuff, but the actual show. Because obviously, the show here is getting some new life on uh, PowerTube TV, and we see the show. How did you hear about it originally? How did you get the audition? So, oh. I, you know, I was doing the monster garage stuff, uh, at the time, uh, or just coming off of doing monster garage, uh, rich Christensen, the host of, uh, pinks. I would, uh, I was also doing some work for McGuire's, uh, car crazy central.com. So I would see rich at different shows. And he says, you know, I'm going to give you, I got, I'm going to put you in a host for something eventually. And I kept saying, sure, rich. Okay, sure. And, uh, then eventually he said, Hey, I got an idea for a show. I'd love you to host it. And, you know, um, and then the rest was there, you know, got, I asked for a lot of money. They said, no, I asked for <laughs> enough money. They said, okay. And we started going now when with the first couple of episodes we did, we did a, like a five show teaser, you know, uh, what, what you call, um, you know, you shoot a pilot, but we did five episodes. And I remember um, Bob Ecker, who was the second in charge or 
one of the top guys at uh, at Speed Channel was sitting up in the booth and we're doing these shows. And after the third episode, he just like he was not happy. I wasn't happy because there was being very strict and they wanted to, you know, Rich wanted it one way. And I was like, OK. And then finally, we had two episodes left to shoot. And I just said, all right, I'm just going to do my swag thing and I'm going to yell at everybody and talk to the camera and do what I did in you know what pro wrestlers do which is you work you look for the camera and after we did the last two episodes I remember looking up and Bob was very happy and he said that's the way the show should be and kind of the rest is history you know I came in weighing 300 I'll go home can about 260 depends if we go by Wendy's or not who weighs more you or him how much do you weigh uh Right down uh, Brett's weight on that when we're ready. <laughs> <laughs> Buddy, if that dog barks again, I'm going to eat him. The dingo ate my baby. What's your name? Scott Fortune. Where do you work, son? The Scott? Right here at GMAT. That's right. I can tell. Paige, take a look in the trunk, see if there's anything in there, would you please? You make any kids in that car? Naturally aspirated. Just like me. What'd you call me? Or what'd you call me? The IRS is much nicer and friendlier now. How you doing, Brett Wagner? Flintfest, I'm Brett Wagner. How are you? By the way, Sizzler, how you doing? Up in, uh, la, 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 la. Blah, 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 blah. Go, what we are. Yeah. Move. Is that Stefan? Is that Stefan? All right. Boomhauer or Bruce? I mean, no. Dan or Bruce there, Greg? Chris. Dan. Captain Psycho. Hit me. We got a pretty good race going on up a stay. Let's do it again. Go say hello to somebody, but make sure you come back. That made no sense. Obviously, it's uh, you know all of us here that on this on your your show right here have had uh, experience in front of the camera, behind the camera. But it's a it's a whole different animal when you have you know you're on a drag strip and there's five cameras and a big giant boom coming down and the pressure's on you. But once I got through, you know, four or five months of doing the show, it, it kind of became very easy and it was a, uh, it's a simple formula and we just had to make sure that people were happy and they had cars to, you know, the hardest part of our show was getting the cars to, to be on the show because, you know, they would tell everybody we're going to be there that weekend sure some of the people had, had signed up or the track said hey we got a certain amount of people that we got but you know th you have to go out there and when you're doing your last show at three in the morning and there's you're, you know, go to the park what kind of run a car do you have sir all right come on you're going to be on the show so that was probably the toughest part was uh and, and hopefully it didn't rain you know because we got very lucky in the six years we did that show that you know, uh, we, it didn't rain very often. It depended on the track you were at. And, uh, you know, there wasn't any oil downs a lot. So we got very lucky and, you know, I think we put out a good product. So. And, and a lot of people don't understand that because from the staff, I mean, not that you put out a good product, but I think from the time scenario, whereas I'm at home and I'm on the couch and I'm watching the TV anytime from, you know, six in the morning to six the next morning. And to me, you're in my time zone. So I, I kind of intellectually understand what it's like to you. Obviously, you're not doing it if I'm watching it at 5 a.m. But the fact that you're there and it can get a lot later than you expect. You say you were recording sometimes until the wee hours of the morning. Yeah. So we would do the first couple of years, we would do 11 episodes, one being we would do one just for an extra show just to make sure we had 10 episodes. So let's say that um, I'm trying to think of one of our Castrol was our sponsor, but you know, we had to do certain every track. We had to do at least 10 episodes. We would do 11 for a safety one. And maybe if one was kind of screwy, they'd throw it on, uh, on the internet, but we would do it in two days. So that's a half, you know, it take me about 45 minutes growing fast to do an episode half hour show. So if there's no oil downs, if there's no problems with the track, if there's no rain, I could possibly get a show done in 45, 50 minutes. Usually the first episode would take an hour and a half. So in two days, you're, you're doing a lot of episodes, you know, back to back and you take a, hopefully you do six on the first day and you do five the next day and you can call it, you know, and then you get go home. So a lot of production, a lot of shows, 
just done in two days. So I don't think people, so sometimes, yeah, if there, it rained, let's say it rained, you know, for 10 minutes at one point when we're in Florida filming, because it rains in Florida every day at a certain time. <laughs> um, <laughs> then you, you just go, you go later into the night. So, yeah, I mean, we raced, uh, I want to say Surprise, Arizona. I forget the track. So we were doing episodes there and it was so cold you know, that we kept putting stuff off and then we couldn't put it off anymore. We had to finish one more episode. I was sure it was four in the morning. And, you know, in cold, you guys know that in the cold, drag race cars don't want to go good down the track. So, you know, it's 50 degrees and they don't want to go down that track really well. And guys don't want to take their cars down the track. So, you know, you go and once in a while, you would, you, we, we'd have to go to the parking lot and say look at you got to rent a car what do you got what kind of cars so sometimes <laughs> you would see a couple episodes you'd be like that's just a regular car yeah well you know we have to do what we have to do but uh yeah it was it was fun i would start to lose my voice after the, this third year you know so we had to and the, i begged and i think our production begged that we get a third day it was just a lot easier to you know to have that just in case that third day there to shoot so Towards the last three years of the of the series, we would we would shoot for three days, which helped my voice, and uh, it helped uh, just in case of any issues with cameras or the track or cars. Now, of the tracks that you went to, did you have one that you really didn't like or did like? Well, I, I don't think it's if I didn't like the tracks. I mean, we, we one time filmed at Roswell, New Mexico, Area Fifty One Dragway. Well, that is in the middle of, um, I remember I had Paige in the car and I said, all right, well, you know, we, we get there like with an hour before shooting, which is fine. Get an hour, get in there, say hello, get, you know, get mic'd up and everything. But area 51 is in a, an old, it's, it's a, I don't know if it's an old air force base, but they paint planes there. Right. So there's a bunch of planes there. And I started, I said, I'll find the entrance. I'll just follow the, you know, the side of the, the, the fence here well after like 45 minutes of drive i'm like well, how big is this thing and they're calling going hey guys we need you here in 10 minutes and i'm like i don't even know where we are so finally we got there so yeah that's a but no all tracks are cool man if you're at the drag strip it's always fun so people, i can't say go ahead no i was just gonna say people are watching the show now on uh power tube tv and they're and they're watching you do what you do what is something a little behind the scenes that maybe people didn't know about this show that went on that might be amusing learning to eat while you're filming at a track for 10 hours is very important because if you eat the wrong things you're in trouble <laughs> well, yeah. you know so you don't you don't want to have to go hey i need to take a a potty yeah. break here for 30 minutes. So, uh, yeah, I remember there was a, we ate a bunch of slim gyms. Now I love a good slim gym, but when you're, when you're working and you're filming and people are, are expecting you to be there for 10 hours and to get this stuff done, you don't want to have slim gyms in your, in your belly. So I learned a valuable lesson that time. Guys, I think we just lost a sponsor. Uh, yeah. No, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Not I'm a the, Jack Lynx. I'm a Jack Lynx beef jerky guy now. So I'm going to go with the Sasquatch and the okay. Jack Lynx. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I get you. I get you. So, so shows like this, though, when Pastime was on, there didn't seem to be a lot of shows like it. And since then, there have been, you know, there's been a few shows that have kind of stepped in your footsteps. Was there anyone you ever liked or anything that kind of you thought was pretty good? You mean of, of the copycats or all the new yeah, stuff? Basically the copycats. I hate them all. I don't like them all. Look, at, I'm a drag race guy, right? I like to go to a track and race. I think it's the safest thing for people to do is you want to go drag race, you go to the drag strip and you, you be safe and you don't go do it in the streets. So as much as um, a lot of those other shows are very popular, I, I'm just not a guy that likes to go down to the, go out on the street and rip it up, you know? So, yeah, I mean, you know, obviously Pink's and Pink's All Out where I, I really love those shows. And, you know, we got the opportunity because of those shows that those shows never would have been on them. Then 
name that test into him, which was the first name, which is was silly name. Yeah. Which became pastime, which was a lot better, a lot better name. Um, without those shows, we never would have got on. So we got very lucky that that stuff was in there. And, you know, and Pink's, uh, no matter what you think, uh, really opened the doors for and revived drag racing, in my opinion. Right. And then, you know, uh, with that comes, you know, the street outlaws later and all these other shows that have been on that they, they keep putting on that you know, keep people drag racing in people's minds, even though it should be at the track. So yeah, yeah without those shows, we'd have been, there would be no fastest uh, game show. Cause that's what we were. We were the fastest game show. And I think still the fastest game show ever on TV, which was, which was pretty cool. Well, like you said, you did it in a drag strip. You could see the numbers. You knew what the drivers were doing. The drivers had to think about what they were doing. And so did the contestants. Uh, not the contestants, but the people on stage that had to predict it. They had to know what they were talking about and understand what the racers were going through. Yeah, I mean, I learned a lot from, listen, I, I had no idea what, uh, you know, when you, eight seconds, eight and a half seconds in a car. I'm like, well, that's not that fast, right? Until you go get in a car and, or a dragster and you go eight and a half seconds, you go, wow, that, you know, that, that is pretty fast. So it, it, the pers it, it it taught a lot of people too, right? About the about drag racing. It's uh, I, I've always had so many people come up going, "Man, I used to watch your show, and my wife got into it, and we learned about drag racing together." And I was like, "Well, that's cool. That's you know, that's what that whole thing was was supposed to be about." We um, I felt it was a fun show to do, right? I got to see a lot of cars. I grew up going to the winter nationals with my dad out in Pomona, you know, and, or we'd go up to, uh, you know, Bakersfield to go, uh, watch races as a kid. And I was like, I never thought that I would have an opportunity now to, you know, be at a track and see all these cool cars up close. I mean, up close. Cause, uh, and you know, and I think my ears are paying the price now after seven years of doing that, at least my right ear is, but, um, and you don't, folks will never understand the, a jet car. And when you are on the track mm -hmm. and there's a jet car there and Ken Herring used to always make fun of me because I wanted to get off of the track where these jet cars would come out. But holy crap, man, a jet car, you know, 50 feet from you is something that uh, it's, it's something to experience. That's for sure. Now you said you got your license. Where did you go to school how did well, you and what did you drive? Well, I, I had an opportunity. I have a friend, Glenn Novakowski, up in Canada. I would go make appearances at Interlake Dragway in Gimli, Manitoba. I'd go up there and do some, you know, the, the big swag from Monster Garage and Pastime. And I'd go up there and make appearances. And he had a couple of dragsters and he said, Listen, would you like to come race for me? I'm like, Listen, man, I, I, I don't know anything about it. I can get in a car and go down a track if it's, you know, nothing spectacular. He says, I'll send you to drag racing school. I'll pay for it. You come up and you'll, you'll race for me. And I said, all right, let's do it. So I didn't think I'd ever fit in a dragster, but I went to Frank Hawley's drag racing school up there in uh, Fontana. Bob, you know that track very well. So we'd go yeah. up to Fontana and uh, in two days I was doing, a, um, you know, 160 miles an hour. You know, and doing low, you know, mid mid eights seconds, and that's where I was like, "Gosh, the, I never realized how fast eight and a half seconds is in a quarter mile. It's fast. It's it's quick, and it's done with." And I remember, you know, in two days, legitimately, you're doing eight and a half seconds at a at, at a track, and I thought this is just maybe it's just too quick. But with Frank Colley. I mean, the guy is a, is just an expert on it. He could tell you just by watching me. He's like, I remember when I did my first full pass, he goes, you're lifting your foot off the pedal at the end. I said, well, no, I'm not. He goes, you are. And I said, Frank, I am not. And I'm uh, sure enough, we watch it. And he says, look, it, you can tell you're, and I'm like, how do you, how do you do that? He said, cause I've been doing it a long time, buddy. So uh, I was very blessed to go to his school. There's of course some other schools out there, but Frank has uh, taken some of the best people ever out there and put them on, uh, you know, got them their license. And, you know, he, he told me, cause I was uh, at his school, I went through the super comp 
Mm -hmm. right i barely fit in that dragster but i got in it did it and then you know going up a, a second faster which uh you do when you go to the top dragster he says you're not going to have a problem he says your issue will be if you get past 200 miles an hour then there's other stuff that comes into play but i think the fastest i ever did was 196 in the quarter mile and if i would have been under 300 pounds randy i would have hit that 200 miles an hour okay so traction it, you're not as, but that's not as heavy as you'd think. I mean, for example, how tall are you? You're got, you got to be what six, six, almost six five. Yeah, you're taller than I am. I'm six three, so it's like, yeah, you're you're a big guy. And the other thing is, and I, I was curious about because I just did this once. I've never been in that position, but one time I was at that little uh, toy, the racetrack over there down the sixty freeway or something like that, where they where they've got the drag race cars and all this other stuff oh. behind the wheel. And Malibu the, Grand Prix. Well, is it is it a Malibu Grand Prix? Uh, yeah, it was something like that. And yeah. basically, you get behind the wheel of the drag car, and you immediately go, oh, this is what G-Force is. <laughs> you know, because you know, all of a sudden, you're one minute, da, 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 boom, and you're way out here, and, and suddenly you feel it. What was your, what was your experience with G-Force? Well, you know, I, I was tucked in there so much into uh, each car. I didn't really, you, you don't have a, a lot of room. I didn't have a lot of room for anything to throw me back. So hmm. um, a couple of times, I mean, I, I loved it. Look at there's now I, I imagine if I got over 200 miles an hour, I'm doing racing a bigger drag sure maybe i would have felt it more but yeah not a big deal at all to me at least me in the in the you know the top dragster it um because i'm tucked in there pretty good i i really do like the feeling of being in a dragster as opposed to a door car i don't know if it's a safety thing or you're you're tucked in there and your helmet's on and there's not a lot of room right there's you're so i feel more protected i think there's that if i'm in a car and you can move all over the place and well, I don't visibility. know what it is. Visibility yeah. is there too. So now, I get, it was I, strange, Bob. It was strange being so low to the ground. So the one thing I had to get that I was a little nervous about is you are so close. I mean, you're lay, you're laying on top of the ground. Really, you're only a couple inches off the ground. So and with a giant motor behind your head. So I mean, obviously, a lot better than in front of your head, which they used to do in the early days oh, we still do yes we still do. i mean but but yeah the, no i i agree when i did the school they said you're going to take your first couple of passes and the signs on the side of the track are going to be blurry by your third or fourth pass now you can read everything because you get used to that acceleration rate yeah no i love it look i think uh, it gives you a better appreciation for a car First of all, when you're out on the freeway in the mean streets of Los Angeles, gives you a much better, uh, you know, and uh, doing 196 miles an hour is, uh, it's over too quick, which I never liked. And that's why I don't like racing eighth, uh, uh, I love quarter mile, eighth mile, I'm not big on. It's just, it's it's over too quick. It's like, oh, because then it's not like, um, especially in the dragster I was in, it was not like you could just go make a pass again. They got to bring the dragster back. They got to change a few things. You got to let it cool down. And so that ride is so over so fast that you're like, oh, man, I want to get back out there and go again. So, yeah, you know, I, uh, I, I did that, too. But I took the, the I turned right and left on purpose uh, when I raced. And that you're, you're looking 25, 30 seconds sometimes on a lap. And you see, so you got a lot of seat time, and I enjoyed that. I like drag racing, but my passion was was being able to turn right and left and control the car. And now yeah. your passion is just being able to get in the car, yeah, and get down yeah. the street, yeah, and and be able to get out, you know, because you know it's just it's sitting too low, and yeah. Yes. Well, listen, I didn't say that. I so me getting into the dragster was a lot easier than getting out. So I would tell you that I had to have a couple of guys help me get out every time. Like, grab me, help me. You had mentioned the the car that spews fire and the whole thing uh, and how loud that was. And uh, I remember uh, at Irwindale, I think uh, they had a car out there once and we were in the press box and it was 
rather deafening up there in the press box. But it, it, the whole thing about vibrations and things that maybe a lot of people in the stands, maybe if they're real close to the uh, track, they understand it. But some of these cars just vibrate or at least send out these sound waves that just go right through you. And the reason I remember that is because I was at uh, uh, the Winter Nationals once, and I was down there, and I think Linda Vaughn was like 10 feet away from me. So I'm thinking, okay, if Linda Vaughn can handle this, anybody, you know, anybody should be able to handle this. So the car came in and was vibrating, and you literally felt it just go right through you. And that, to me, was just an interesting sidebar of drag racing that maybe for people who do it on a daily basis or during the season all the time, yeah, it's no big deal. But for some people, I don't think they realize just how much the vibration and the noise is. The only thing that I can equate to that that's similar, and I mean, you're going to say this is just strange, but if you've ever been up close to a tiger, and I used to, I was at a tiger sanctuary, and I got right up, it was such a big, it was like an 1,100 pound Bengal tiger. And it sits up against and you. You can get close to the cage. You just can't look at it in its eye. And like an idiot, I looked at it in its eye and it let out a, oh, this big growl, which knocked me over. Right. And I felt it through my whole body. And that's the only thing I can really equate it to because you feel it throughout your whole body when you're getting into some of these cars or you're on the track and you just, it's, it's something you'll, it's, you have to experience, you know, but the wonderful thing about it is that Frank Colley's drag racing school and some of these other schools, they, they put on classes year round all at different tracks. And it's not that expensive to get out there. And believe me, uh, you know, whether you're in a door car, which I don't fit very well, I wanted to maybe get into his door cars, but uh, I fit in the dragster, which was nice. And yeah. Uh, yeah. A tiger will knock you over and so will a, a jet dragster. So. Yeah, a lot of people don't think about it. watching videos now that are showing up about the nitro virgins. Someone goes to a drag strip, they've never heard or seen a nitro car, and all of a sudden it goes by them and they just get they're totally shocked because this controlled explosion is driving by them at great neck speed, creating all sorts of sensory issues that uh, they're just not prepared for. Well, and not to, and not to mention the smell, right? I mean, there's yeah. a that nitro. And I've watched uh, my buddy Gary Tater Gilmore, who races a nitro bike. I've watched mm -hmm. him mix his fuel, and I'm sitting in there watching. Don't spill this on you, as he's spilling it all over himself. And he's like, <laughs> "But I've been doing it for 40 years, so don't worry about it." But that that smell, the burning of the eyes, it's um, and I can't imagine. Now you know we didn't run nitro in the dragster I ran, but I can't imagine being in there trying to keep all your senses together, trying to keep focused. You have this smell that's burning your nostrils and your eyes, and you still have to control a 200, 300 mile an hour dragster or something crazy. I always say when I go out to a nitro race, and I was just at one this last weekend, um, I don't need my pills for a whole week or two. I, I don't need nitro pill at all. I'm fine. <laughs> And my allergies don't bother me. My my nostrils are cauterized. I've never I, heard those two words together to describe your nostrils. <laughs> cauterized. Huh. All right. Yeah. Well, it, it does. Uh, it does aerate the sinuses a little bit. I think it yeah. does. So, so, so pastime was a lot of fun, and of course, you moved on from that, and now you're, you're now, as I understand it, you're still doing Monster Garage, correct? Well, we did two years ago. We did nine new episodes uh, of Monster Garage, and I, I believe, in my opinion, they were the best. Uh, you know, we had a bunch of guys who would grew up on that show. Uh, uh, ben Wood, who is uh, executive producer, he's doing Robert Downey Jr.'s new show, uh, the Car Show. So he's executive producer of that, and uh, he grew up, you know, f working probably as a PA on Monster Garage and then moved his way up to being a producer, camera guy and everything else. So when we redid these nine, when we did these new nine shows, he was one of our, our, our producers on there. And a lot of guys that had worked on the show, you know, in the past, because we, you know, we started that 20 years ago or 21 years ago when yeah. we first did the first Monster Garages. So um, to come back, they were great. Um, 
I just don't think Discovery Channel did a lot of enough advertising on it because everybody who watched them said these things are great. We did nine new episodes. They aired them. Now, will we ever do any more? I don't know. I think Jesse's got his own his own network now. He does his own. He has his own channel that he does stuff on. And I think obviously Discovery owns the the rights to Monster Garage. So, but it was fun. It was you know that was a, my first show ever. You know, being able to not just be a voice, but be a character, you know, the big swag and the voice of Monster Garage. And I got to host a few things. And it was my first um, experience with, you know, uh, I don't know, I don't want to say fame, but, uh, you know, people knowing who I was and people going, oh, it's the big swag, you know, and that was that was pretty cool. That show uh, obviously opened the doors for every other automotive and uh you know fix it show ever that opened up the door when we met was yeah. about that time you you were uh, riding lawnmowers yes well i was the i was the voice and i still am the voice of bad boy mowers out of arkansas badboymowers.com so if you need a zero turn lawnmower you know where to go get one yeah that was great listen i uh, was blessed yeah. Um, and that look at it, it helped being on Monster Garage because I was the voice for the bad boy in the West Coast, Jesse James, on a popular show for Discovery. And when I got out to Arkansas, Batesville, Arkansas, the home of bad boy mowers, I, I really liked the town. I went in to do um, a car show to MC a burnout contest and probably a Daisy Dukes contest. Bob, you don't don't get excited about the Daisy Dukes. <laughs> no, no, um, I don't wear them. They're too short for me. I, you know. But um, I just I, I like this town. So... Uh. Yeah, it's not a good visual, Randy. Uh, uh, but I like this town so much that I said, "Hey, work, work. How does a guy make a living in this town?" They said, "Well, it's either the church, which I am not opposed to church, but I didn't think I could make a living there, and uh, or there's a new lawnmower company and." I just bad boy mowers and I just kept pestering them for a couple of years until they said, all right, what do you want to do? I said, well, you're going to run commercials eventually. Why not let me uh, be the voice of those commercials? And 21 years later, I'm still doing it and I'm blessed and thank goodness. But yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Monster garage was a very, uh, very big show for me. Uh, I, it opened the doors a lot. It, um, it got me kind of known and I would go out and do, you know, bike shows, car shows. And, you know, it's, uh, it just opened a lot of doors for me and for a lot of people. So very buzz. Well, I, listen, you, I wouldn't have been on pastime if there was no monster garage. So, well, it made you a good, it made you a good guy. So the, the, uh, the other characters you were playing in movies. Oh yes. Cause I played a lot of scumbags in TV shows and movies. Speaking of which, uh, you were on The Bold and the Beautiful. You were on a soap opera? I've done a bunch of soap operas, yes. Bold and the Beautiful. Honey, what else have I done? Passions. I'm asking my wife. <laughs> Passions, which was another soap opera. Um, I've done a few, yes. All, all is the uh, object of affection for the women, correct? You were all the... Of course. Never, never the so... guy, but you were like... Probably thug number one. Thug number two, bad guy number five, you know stuff like that. Um, oh, same time, yeah. Yes, because I'm a I'm a character actor on TV, so you get those over thirty years of acting, you'll get those roles, but you relish in them, and they they pay your rent. <clears throat> well, and of course, the one I thought was always a kick, and I, I think we talked about this last time you were on the show, was the uh, Muppet Who Done It, the Happy Timer. <laughs> I just thought that was I just thought that was great. Randy, that shows that you have a little bit of style to you as well as class, because not many people will say Happy Time Murders, but yes. Very funny movie, Melissa McCarthy and uh, a bunch of puppets, or Muppets. Can't say Muppets, so a bunch of puppets. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that was a fun movie. It was a, a, an odd movie, but, and I think it, I, I, I'm in there for about four or five seconds. Oh, that was it? Gee, it seemed like much longer to me. Maybe automatically you went into that slow-mo you see when you... Yes. Yeah. Okay, yeah. that be it. Bob... Well, Hannah Montana, you know, NCIS, Sons of Anarchy, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, which I do a lot of stuff now with, with um, 
you know, the horror movie convention circuit is a big deal. Sci-fi and horror. I mean, it, we're talking the put 30,000 people through a, a convention on a weekend. So um, I, I'm very blessed to be able to go and, you know, sign at those for some of the horror movies I've been in. And uh, in fact, we'll be in Buffalo, New York, uh, at the end of this month for the Nickel City Con, you know, with a, a bunch of my of my friends out there signing and it'll be the whole Sons of Anarchy reunion deal going on out there. So which uh, I will sneak in a picture or two. And yeah, it's, it. We're, I'm very blessed for all the TV shows I've done and continue to still do so. Now, what Anything is, new coming up? I was just to say real quick, what is the difference between the fans who go to the uh, horror shows, if you will, the conventions, and let's say your typical Star Trek fan or something like that, or are they the same? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, there's a whole bunch of Trekkie fans, which is basically the same. I mean, the let's let's uh, let's compare like drag racing folks, fans of drag racing, to uh, the fans that you'll meet at a horror movie convention. Okay, they're not even the close. I mean, the drag <laughs> racing fans are very cool, very hip. Oh yeah, great horror movie people, science fiction. Trekkies, all that stuff are beyond uh, obsessed. I mean, super obsessed, which is wonderful, which is great because I am, I got into acting because I loved horror movies and that's why I wanted to be an actor. So I could specifically be some kind of creature monster guy, which doesn't always happen. And I've been very blessed to do a lot of stuff under makeup as a monster, but yes, rabid rabid horror movie fans and science fiction folks. They all come in costume? Anybody ever oh, show up your mask? Oh, yeah, all the time. Listen, cosplay is a big deal at this stuff. And I have a good friend, Jordan Duforic. His company is called Horror School Customs on Instagram. And his whole job is making costumes and masks for people that are fa that's what he does for a living for people that do cosplay that go to conventions actors like myself who need uh, i need my 2003 leatherface costume when i'm going doing conventions because i will do full leatherface photo ops with the fans so there is such a big market for this stuff that People like my friend Jordan, that's what they do. They make these costumes for folks. They make the masks for folks. And it's that big a deal that a guy can go, who might have been a, just a passion for him because he wanted to make his own mask and not spend 800 bucks to go buy someone else's. But now they are making, this is what they do for a living. It's that big a, big a deal. Go ahead, Bob. Okay, where am I going? I forgot. That was a long time now ago. Now, Bob's mask. Yes. The mask that yeah, Bob you like this is wearing. One. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's expensive. Yeah, oh, that's a thousand dollar piece at least. It <laughs> has cost me years to get it to look like this. <laughs> and by the way, if you want a mask of Bob, uh, we'll pass that on to the folks at uh, yeah. TV because I guess they're going to start doing T-shirts and hats and all that other stuff. Yeah, the show. my my face, I'm sure. Bob I can see that big. now. Mask of Bob might be big. Yeah, sure. Uh huh. Okay. <laughs> What's up with you? Uh, what's up with you now? As far as uh, you got anything else in the hat? Anything working? Well, I'm, I mean, I, I'm still in touch with Jesse James. Um, you know, he's building these wonderful, very awesome guns out there, and in uh, in, uh, in Austin, Texas, uh, his company. And then they're also he has his own network now. So he's uh, chatted with me a little bit about maybe doing some voiceovers for some stuff for him, or doing some hosting. For yeah. some shows he he has uh, ideas for. Is he doing any more some, motorcycles? Uh, uh, he's still making motorcycles for a few select folks uh, out of my price range, but um, uh, I'm excited about that. Of course, I audition still for TV and film and hosting, and you know, um, you're not going to get a better host than any three of us out here on this podcast right now that uh, on this TV like show. There's not going to be. No, uh, no, really, go on. Come there, on. Yeah, come on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's going. not going to be. So, <laughs> you know, I, hosting is a wonderful deal, and I, I, I audition a lot still for stuff, and I work with uh, a good friend of mine, John Jones, uh, uh, Breakpoint Media, who's 
executive produced a lot of shows for uh, Discovery Channel and Animal Planet and everything. And we have a couple ideas that we're trying to put together right now. So, you know, uh, hopefully something happens. And I finished a movie this year called Desert Fiends, where oh. I play a nice, I play Papa, a little crazed mutant, big crazed mutant. So hopefully yeah. we'll... Thanks, we man. will uh we will start shooting part two hopefully by the end of the year and cool Very you good. never know what's gonna go on man listen i'm ready for anything oh <laughs> I, mean, I think we should do pastime again to be honest with you listen with uh brian basson and those guys uh, i think that uh the the rights to pastime and uh pinks all out and all that good stuff's in good hands right now with brian and his uh cast of characters over there at the network so I would love to see that done again. And I think that we could, uh, we would get all our old fan base back and plus a whole bunch of new folks to do that show again. So that would be awesome. And if we do the first episode, we would have, you know, you and Bob on Randy to be uh, our, our, our contestants up on the side of the stage. Oh my. Yeah. I can oh go for that. Yes. Yours too, huh? My drag racing math. Y yeah. Math. Uh huh. Oh, okay. I got a calculator. Yeah, I got an abacus. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe Dusty. He could be. Well, yeah. No one's going to know what that is. Now, you say that, right? You just pulled the yeah. word out <laughs> that I barely that I barely knew in high school. Yeah, right? I know. And I'm yeah. like, oh, yeah, that is, uh, yeah, that's something the smart kids in the you math the AP stuff. class say. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's very good. So uh, that, of course, is what's coming up. And by the way, you had mentioned the uh, Robert Downey Jr. show. That's yeah. That's, that, uh, um, what did you have you seen the promos for that and what do you think about the concept listen i love the concept i've seen the promos uh they just had their uh at the peter sims museum uh, a couple nights ago a couple nights ago babe yeah were you there yes yeah oh, no, i was there. not there my my, hey, my wife was our... my wife got to go oh i was gonna say you can be a uh you can be our uh, reporters on the scene uh well, how was that <laughs> Gosh, I wish I could have gone. My wife loved it. They had a beautiful red carpet. It's um, bring her in, it, and then we'll ask her about it. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't think she wants to come in right now. She's <laughs> waving me off, going like this. Okay. Yeah. Uh -oh. But um, I can't tell uh, you, you know, women have done that to me. Okay. All right. Uh, boy, there's a joke there, and I won't go for it. Um, <laughs> It's, uh, I think he's a great guy. He's a guy that cares about people a lot. I think. Um, you know, he's got a good team around him. Like I said, my buddy who's executive producer, Ben Wood. Um, he's got people that understand t car TV shows. Um, he's He's got a big heart. I love the concept of the show. I think that, uh, I think it's going to be a big deal. I mean, you know, listen, uh, Robert Downey, for God's sakes, he's a, he is a, he's an example of a, true american icon right now i will say and i uh, think that he uh he's going to do great stuff with this show i think it's going to be a big hit good. look forward to that and that of course coming up on hbo max oh, excuse me max, max. yes max anymore. so that's going to be coming up so well we will we look forward to seeing more of you and yeah. if you guys want to see more of uh our buddy brett wagner on the show. Uh, don't forget to see him on Pastime on the Power Tube TV uh, streaming network uh, in various locations. You can get it on Roku. You can get it on uh, YouTube on their uh, Power Tube TV channel. And I, I believe there's several other places that they're kicking around putting in uh, soon. So stay tuned for that. I'm sure we'll be showing it all on our uh, social media, that kind of stuff, Facebook, uh, Twitter. Well, and congratulations to you two guys, because it's nice to see you both who have, uh, you've withstand the, the tortures of friendship over 30 <laughs> years or 40 years, you two. And it's good that you guys can still stand each other. Well, and, uh, Zoom, but, okay? He's in one state, I'm in another. I, I, yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's but, in the... Each in the state of confusion. Yes. Yeah. But you guys are, are great ambassadors to the, the world of automotives and uh, the automotive world out there. And I appreciate you too. And I'm glad that you guys can still come on and put a show on and have people uh, learn. Thank you. Appreciate that. And of Thanks. course. Thanks, Brad. Yeah, thank no, you. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Don't forget, everybody, uh, our website, the new website is watchpttv.com. As I mentioned, you can check us out on other locations around the interweb. 
Uh, don't forget, you could also uh, check out our next shows. We're on every Wednesday with new shows, and you can watch them, of course, anytime. And don't forget the shows we've already put out. We've had some pretty fun guests, and you can see all sorts of things from slot cars to bogey to uh, all sorts of good stuff. So that's something you're going to want to check out. What's that, Bob? Oh, slot cars. Behind. Slot cars. Yeah. So until next time, I'm Randy. That's Bob. That's Brett. And uh, don't forget, having fun talking about cars. We will see you next time. So long, everybody. Like this show? Want more? Then head to WatchPTTV.com, the new 100% free PowerTube TV streaming network. Home of the best classic and new motorsports racing and build shows on the web.